गुड मॉर्निंग ऑल आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ स्टडी आई क्यू आई एस इंग्लिश माई नेम इज प्रतिश माथुरकर आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस एग्जाम्पलर जर्नी एंटाइटल्ड द हिंदू एनालिसिस जोन वेर एन आई डिस्कस द रेलिवेंट टिटबिट्स वेर आई डू द एनालिसिस ऑफ द रेलिवेंट आर्टिकल्स ऑफ एनी डेज हिंदू तो आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ मी आई वेलकम यू ऑल ऑन द बिहाफ ऑफ स्टडी आई क्यूज एंटायर टीम and i welcome you all to this exemplary session wherein we will try to analyze the present day's hindu from two perspectives number one the first perspective that i will be targeting with each and every one of you will be from the utilitarian perspective good morning anup so the utilitarian perspective means how you can use this knowledge to directly improve your marks in mains so the first thing that i'll be focusing on you all scoring maximum amount of marks in mains and some of the analysis will be helpful from pulmis perspective too so 15 to 20 marks or dare i say 20 to 30 marks in prelims sometimes even 40 if the paper of the civil services preliminary examination becomes very much current affairs centric or you can also have mains application between 100 to 300 and dare i say 400 to 500 if essay comes in the current affairs perspective too but over the years the essays have been very philosophical so we don't know in which headwinds the upsc will follow but let's now also assume that if essay comes in this perspective or you can quote the examples from newspapers so you will all be very comfortable with that too okay now the second dimension which i'm opening up with you all today up till now i didn't open up this dimension with you all but now i think that this being the third week of the analysis you and me are now getting good together you and me are now comfortable with each other's approach and you have understood my way of analyzing the paper so now i feel that this is pretty important that i open up the another dimension of this session so i am tapping into my pandora's box and now i'm picking up something which is highly important and guys that is language that is vocabulary okay that is your writing skills okay because your competition is going to be with some of the most educated people in india okay after you are clearing the civil services examination and you are going for performing your duty as a civil servant the way you speak the way you articulate things the way you make your feelings your ambitions your perspectives your way of implementation understand the other people understand the people those who are standing on the other side of your desk is going to be of very much significance it is going to be of paramount importance so now from today onwards i will be also focusing on language so today onwards what i expect from each and every one of you except the maintaining of four foil folders except before during this session before attending this session you have already marked up the articles which are important from your end now the third thing which i expect each and every one of you to do is that you need to maintain a diary now diary of what diary of good vocabulary skills diary of good sentences which you can directly utilize in your mains which you can directly use to supplement your ethics answers your case studies your essays so this is the other dimension that i will be opening up now and from today onwards i will make sure that i will also help you in understanding such kind of endeavors which i will take on the behalf of the analysis of him okay so welcome all warmest regards to everyone today's day is a very special day in world history okay why because it was today 8th of may that finally the reign of hitler came to an end and finally there was peace in the entire world okay so today's day 8th of may marks the day of tranquility and peace from the outskirts from the outwings of the world war 2 okay so you all know that world war 1 world war 2 they did heavy damage to the world order they did heavy damage to the world society and since world war 2 there have been numerous efforts to maintain the peace and tranquility but as of now it has all yet been shattered so history does repeat itself first as tragedy then as farce so we don't know where it will go but 8th of may marks the first day of tranquility in peace after roughly 6 to 7 years of war okay so 
I tend to give some advice to you all today that you need to fight battles in life. Battles are need to be fought, battles need to be won. But you need to understand the battles which you are fighting, those battles will come at what cost. Okay, if you do cost benefit analysis of the battles you are fighting in life, you will come to know, you will understand that half of the battles that you are fighting are not worth fighting. And the battle which is actually worth fighting, you are not putting your 100% efforts. There I say you are not even putting 10% of efforts. So, whatever battles you are fighting in your life as of today, let they be physical battles, let they be mental battles, let they be spiritual battles, let they be emotional battles, any kind of battles you are fighting. So everyone today please do a cost benefit analysis of those battles at what cost you are fighting and what you tend to achieve the outcomes of the battles okay so after that only you will be able to focus as to which battles are important in your life and which battles should be won okay so take this advice as a very good advice because it's your life it's your heart it's your mind and no one else should be able to rule you no one else should be able to misguide you so it's you which you have to take the path and mind you guys you all being the aspiring civil servants you have to lead the society so first you need to fight your internal battles first you need to win your internal battles and then only you can think of leading the society in an ethical way in a transparent way okay so everyone please reassess yourself everyone please kind of do a rechecking of yourself and today onwards start on new journey that yes now we will win those battles which we thought were impossible and we will do it with great vigor and success is bound to come okay so let's start our today's analysis of hindu so before that i will again like to quickly introduce myself my name is pritesh maturkar okay i will be your primary faculty for analyzing the hindus of any day okay you can reach out to me on a telegram channel called as HAZ. I have kept deliberately on the lines of SEZ, the special economic zone. So you have the Hindu analysis zone. And I want each and every one of you to add a S besides it. Okay, S means special Hindu analysis. Why? Because whatever I'll be teaching, I'll be doing the analysis. But you have to make it special. You have to see that you are giving this content the utmost respect, the utmost value by working upon it. Okay. So the channel name is HAZ. For joining this channel, you can just do a global search on Telegram at the Hindu Analysis Zone, wherein after the discussion of the PDFs, wherein the discussion of the relevant affairs of any day's Hindu, just after that, I quickly post whatever I'm discussing on the class so that one hour with me. 30 to 35 minutes with you in one and a half hours you are done with your current affairs analysis and dare i say guys 80 percent of this will be taken care of by the newspaper only okay rest 20 percent you can manage by current affairs magazine but even that too you will be able to do it very easily you will set sell through very easily if you do this properly okay so please join this channel and uh, please have trust faith in me that yes you and me will set sail together okay good morning sonali yeah i hope everyone is doing fine those who are watching me and those who will be watching me later on so in every class i tend to give you a severity level i tend to paint a picture as to how important articles are so today i will be discussing the articles of yesterday the 7th of may that is sunday and also today that is 8th of may monday okay so the severity score of the articles is between 4 to 5 of all the articles except one. One article is having severity score of 10 directly. Okay, so it's very, very important article. It, it is imperative on your end that you are summarizing that article. It is imperative on your end that you are adding it to your notes. So one article is of level 10, rest of the articles is between 4 to 6. So moderate level, application based prelims and mains both okay the 10th the 10 severity level article predominantly the mains based article but rest of the articles both prelims as well as mains perspective okay so please keep in mind today's severity level and please understand the 
highly important tensibility article that article is on water senses okay and it has again put a big smile on my face why i will let you know okay so let's start with a very positive note today it does happen guys that most of the days the articles are not that encouraging but today's articles are pretty much encouraging so we will have a very kind of positive atmosphere in today's session so the first article is a very uh, what i can say an article which is encouraging encouraging why because when people come together when people do something for the betterment of society it greatly benefits everyone in the society okay and this is a very peculiar article with regards to involvement of schools with involvements of the civil society in predicting weather okay up till now we have not yet seen such a novel initiative anywhere in india but for the first time now the schools in kerala are doing what they are setting up their own weather monitoring stations and they will be interlinking data with each of the schools and they will be presenting daily weather forecast hourly weather forecast to the students so that you know kerala being a state where you have heavy battering of monsoons where you have heavy amount of rainfall for majority of the year per se so there you need some useful data as to how you can manage the floods as to how you can instruct the students whether they should come to the school or not how much is the risk so all of this is now going to be managed by schools in collaboration with imd so very novel kind of initiative and this such initiatives do put a smile on our face why because finally the society gets interlinked with one another and you have the development in the fields of science and tech which is doing this so you have a very uh, elaborate bullet in your civil services main syllabus awareness in the fields of science and technology so this article it with regards to that only and it, this article is also with regards to the participation of civilian society so please see this article from that perspective today except the 10 severity level article water census each of the articles that i'm presenting you today you don't need to summarize you just need to patiently listen to me and keep those articles in mind as examples as case studies so today you can relax don't need to jot many things down you can just listen to me you can just listen to my voice and remember my voice okay so 250 schools weather stations to be on stream in kerala in new academic year so 250 schools will come together for weather monitoring okay it is a breath through that paves way for future in which area specific or micro weather data will be collected through school based weather stations to understand conditions to predict a pattern and possibly avoid crisis like situation so what is this basically okay there a area called as thirur in kerala you have an area called as thirur in kerala in that area 250 schools are coming together to set up joint weather monitoring stations and this novel initiative is why so of much of importance why because it is a breakthrough that paves a way a future in which area specific or micro weather data will be collected through school based weather stations area specific or micro weather data so many times you will see this that in your locality you are having rainfall but as you go outside your locality and you enter into a different locality there is absolutely no rainfall okay so this is called as micro society specific data wherein each locality each society will generate its own data for a real-time analysis of what is happening in a city town or village so a location called as thirur in kerala is doing this okay so micro weather data or area specific data will be collected through school based weather stations to understand conditions to predict pattern as to how is the pattern and possibly avoid crisis like situations these efforts are underway in around 250 schools in the state through a program you need to remember this program guys from prelims perspective what is the program it is samarga shiksha kerala the prelims program name of the program is samarga shiksha kerala under the general education department in collaboration with advanced center for atmospheric radar research 
वॉट इज द नेम ऑफ द सेंटर एडवांस सेंटर फॉर एटमोस्फेरिक रडार रिसर्च कोची यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी ओके दीज वेदर स्टेशन आर एक्सपेक्टेड टू बी फुल्ली फंक्शनल विद द री ओपनिंग ऑफ स्कूल फॉर न्यू एकेडमिक सीजन दैट को इनसाइड विद ओपनिंग ऑफ रेनी सीजन ओके तो यू ऑल नो मॉनसून जनरली गिवस इट्स ऑनसेट इट इट गिवस इट्स Uh, intimation that yes i have arrived in kerala in the last week of may or in the first week of june and that is when majority of the schools do reopen so all of the weather stations are expected to be fully functional by the time the monsoon gives its monsoon on the malabar coast okay a teacher associated with the program said that the school based weather stations will not only help generate reliable data but also create background for drawing students with an aptitude to reach search in the future so see what this will do you will not only have area specific data you will not only have micro weather based data but all of this will help what all of this will help motivate the students all of this will inculcate the scientific temper in students so fulfillment of dpsp okay so Scienti inculcation of scientific temper is very much necessary in the young students. Why? Because if you inculcate scientific temper in those, they in the future they have the propensity to become some of the greatest minds that India has produced. Notable example I can give is Abdul Kalam. Okay, so you know the life of that person. He was very much motivated since his college days, since his school days only. So just imagine that if we can generate. hundreds and hundreds of kalams every year in india where we will have india in the future okay so this is very important guys they will not only help generate reliable data but also recreate the background for drawing students with aptitude to research in the future it's a aptitude guys okay there is a difference between attitude and aptitude aptitude is something which is inherent which you need to inculcate which you can improve upon and once you have aptitude which recognizes scientific temper or which has the base of scientific temper then the students are bound to follow very distinguished paths in their life okay if you inculcate scientific temper right from the childhood then your mind opens up then the mind of the aspirants in the school it opens up to avenues which are now going to be very important from india's future why because we are all now living in the era of global warming induced climate change so there is a need that india has good initiatives india has good research projects with regards to this why because india has some of the biggest coastlines in asia and you all know sea level rise the changing monsoon patterns the changing weather patterns they are going to batter india like anything and india being a economy which is predominantly dependent on agriculture as its primary livelihood source such kind of initiative such kind of research is very much needed in india so see how many dimensions i have opened up in just one headline article so this is what i want each and every one of you to do now you start you need to now appreciate the diversity of the articles in which the questions can be framed and which you can form your opinions to okay so let's move now move ahead this was the first article of today now the next article that i am discussing with you all okay it's again a headline news but right now tb is very much in news tuberculosis okay uh, why it is in news what are the initiatives taken by the government that will surely come as a separate article don't worry that's my promise to you because what i have seen in the analysis of hindu is if the issue is so damn important it will surely repeat in the editorials in the text and context so i am 100% sure that this issue will now be reverting in the text and context page too right now you just need to understand that india has one of the highest burdens of tuberculosis anywhere in the world okay tuberculosis is caused by a bacteria called as mycobacterium tuberculae okay each one of you who are watching this sessions including me there is approximately 90 to 95% chance that we are harboring mycobacterium tuberculae in our lungs in our alveoli the thing being that that bacteria is in dormant state that bacteria is in latent state okay why because 
your immunity is good why because your body's metabolism is good your body is fighting the bacteria tuberculum bacteria you will find anywhere in the environment and 100% chance dare i say 100% chance that majority of us might be infected with that bacteria but because of our body's immunity because of our body's inherent fighting mechanism we are still not getting that bacteria but now the people who smoke the people who drink alcohol the people who have their immunity compromised the latent bacteria becomes active and tb in india has also become drug resistant now what do you mean by this guys what do you mean by drug resistance you need to just understand this i'm just diverting my discussion for two minutes because this article is relevant from that perspective only okay what do you mean by drug resistance so now many of you must have done this i will dare include myself too it's not good that i'm not including myself okay it's not good that i'm not including myself in this so what do you mean by this is that <clears throat> okay so you need to uh, you need to understand this from the mains perspective what do you mean by drug resistance what do you mean by a pathogen who has become drug resistance and how it tends to evolve with regards to the um forming of uh, a thing called as drug resistance sorry there are some power issues in this area we will just uh, rectify everything and come back so drug resistance basically means that if you are taking let's say paracetamol if you suffer from headache if you suffer from kind of a uh, thing called as let's say fever and if you are taking tablets of paracetamol ibuprofen and if just imagine that the bacteria or the viral or the pathogen becomes resistance to that okay it becomes resistance to it so what will happen the drug will no more do what the drug will no more work upon your body the drug will no longer work against the pathogen so why because the pathogen has become resistant to that drug because of your overuse if you tend to overuse drugs if you tend to do out of the counter shopping or out of the pocket expenditure on the medicine shops so because of that what happens because of that because of heavy persistent of drugs in your body in your gut system the pathogen becomes drug resistant the pathogen become drug resistant so what is happening over here is what is happening in this case study is that the tuberculosis bacteria has become drug resistant okay drug resistant in the sense of what that whatever drugs were there for the treatment of tuberculosis mycobacterium tuberculae has become resistant to it so there are two drugs in fighting the tuberculosis they are called as first line drugs second line drugs third line drugs so tuberculosis has become resistant to first line drug also and tuberculosis has become resistant to second line drugs too so because of this what you are having in india is normal tuberculosis you also have mdr tb mdr tb stands for multi drug resistant tb and you also have extensively drug resistant tb i am again reiterating guys you have normal tb you have mdr tb and you have xdr tb what do you mean by drug resistant that if any pathogen gets resistant to any of the drugs which you are putting in your gut so if tuberculosis bacteria is getting resistant to any drug in if the mycobacterium tuberculae is not getting subdued its viral load is not getting subdued in spite of you consuming drugs then it will result into gravest of consequences and because of this tuberculosis is a very potent kind of disease that we have in india why because in india we not only have normal tb patients but we have mdr tb patients we have xdr tb patients and in the future apart from climate change apart from global warming amr it stands for antimicrobial resistance this is going to be very very kind of daunting situation for us all so what i want each and every one of you to do today is to have a one page write up on what do you mean by amr antimicrobial resistance 
the microbes the pathogens they become resistant to the drugs per se guys i tend to repeat the things 10 times so that my voice gets registered in your brain and then and there itself you have that kind of concept imbibed in yourself so please remember that tb bacteria in india has become resistant to first line drugs has become resistant to second line drugs also so we have normal tb we have mdr tb it is called as multi drug resistant tb and number three we also have xdr exclusively drug resistant tb okay so what is the headline news now okay so now just imagine if a person like me is getting tuberculosis okay my immunity is compromised my body is not functioning properly so there is a high chance that if my immunity is already compromised that if i am a heavy smoker if i am a heavy drinker or if i am suffering from any of the other lifestyle diseases like diabetes so there is a high chance that the tb bacteria in my body can become resistant to drugs why because of its increased potency if the potency of the drugs is not able to subdue the bacteria then what will happen the bacteria will become drug resistant and for drugs to function in your body you require proper functioning of your body too it's just like that just imagine that if you are suffering from fever and what if you are consuming paracetamol paracetamol is not working in your body why because your body is not able to absorb it your body is not able to process it then what's the use so this news is has become important from this perspective that what we will do as soon as a patient becomes a TB patient, so we will do what we will do genome sequencing. We will see whether this patient possesses the genes, whether this patient possesses the part of genomes wherein you have a propensity of the TB becoming resistant to drugs, wherein you have a propensity of TB becoming resistant to first line drugs, second line drugs. Hence, you have this as one of the most important headline news in India wherein now we will use genome sequencing where we will use the knowledge of DNA repair technologies like CRISPR-Cas9 to treat TB. So please read this news from this perspective only. Okay, so TB is a treatable disease but, but Drug resistance is now a major public health concern exacerbated by the emergence of multi and extensively drug resistant TB. India has the highest burden of MDR TB. MDR TB will stand for multi drug resistant TB with the World Health Organization putting the figure at 0.39 million cases worldwide and highlighting the need to stop its spread. If long term treatment Higher drug toxicity and costly drug treatment make the MDR and XDR TB challenging to treat. A group of scientists led by CSR Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology in a new study established that mutations in DNA repair genes could be used in the early diagnosis of the MDR and XDR TB. What do you mean by this? Mutations in DNA repair genes could be used for early diagnosis in of mdr and xdr tb okay so mutations where mutations in dna repair genes okay so as soon as you get some viral load your body gets into a activation your body starts to fight the virus your body starts to fight the pathogen so based upon your dna structure based upon your ancestry it determines how much you are able to fight that virus why because some persons have inherently weak immunity some persons have inherently very strong immunity so some persons are born rajnikan some persons are not born rajnikan so we will try to do what we will try to ensure that if your dna structure is not able to support such heavy heavy pathogenic load so we will repair that we will use genome sequencing we will sequence your dna we will see where your DNA structure is failing if you have such kind of onset of TB and we will repair that so that your TB in your body does not become MDR TB, XDR TB. 
this is a very crude explanation guys but i need to do this for each and every one of you so that you get the issue from the fundamental level okay and i'm giving my 100 percent guarantee that this kind of news will surely come in the text and context page so let's move ahead the study identified a compromised dna repair as one of the novel mechanisms for evolution of drug resistance in mycobacterium tuberculae which causes tuberculosis in humans the study identified a compromised DNA repair as one of the novel mechanisms for evolution of drug resistance in mycobacterium tuberculae in the humans. So, we will not only isolate the humans, we will also see where you can play with the DNA structure of the virus also, wherein you can play with the DNA structure of TB also. Okay. So, we will also see whether you can do something in the TB bacteria, whether you can tweak something in TB bacteria so that the TB bacteria also does not become resistance to first line drugs, second line drugs and there and there we control the spread of the bacteria in the society and your lungs too. Okay. So, please remember this as a headline news. Please remember this as a kind of article which has good propensity in India to be used for controlling tuberculosis okay so this is the second article which was important today now let's move ahead with the discussion of the most important article that we have but before that again a very good headline based article and very good case study for your understanding of earth for your understanding of as to how the planet earth is interlinked okay so I'm being a little bit philosophical in this. Why? Because you can directly quote this in your mains. You can directly use then your essays too. Okay. No life on earth is unutilized. I'm again reiterating. No life on earth is unutilized. Every life form which comes on the planet earth, which is born on planet earth, it has some utilitarian value, it has some its own ecological niche, it performs some functions and even when it becomes dead, even when it loses on life, the dead form of that entity also is utilized in mother nature and this article or this headline news is regards to that only. Okay, so today I am drastically altering your perspective those of you who are watching me those of you who will be watching me on a later date i hope that the words which are keep which are now coming in my mouth will tend to alter your perspective once and for all okay and what's that perspective see this you all know that you have one of the world's biggest deserts in sahara in the sahel belt of africa okay now if you see the geological history, Sahara was once covered by huge water body. There were inland seas where you have Sahara today. And in that inland seas, you had a rich biodiversity of marine organisms. So if you go today to the central Sahara, if you go today to Chad, if you go today to Niger, there in the deserts, buried in the deserts, you will see carcasses of fish. You will see carcasses of marine animals and you know why these carcasses are so damn important why because the winds from sahara the winds which are blowing out of sahara they carry the calcium of the exoskeleton of these animals okay dead carcass means it's predominantly bones so bones you all know they are made up of calcium okay so calcium is carried out from the winds of sahara minerals whatever minerals are there they are blown out of from sahara and all these minerals and all this calcium is deposited by winds where in amazon okay you all know amazon it's an equatorial rainforest where you have heavy amount of rainfall and when you have so much amount of rainfall everything is washed away from the ground so the grounds of amazon are actually devoid of what they're actually devoid of minerals they're actually devoid of calcium they are also actually devoid of phosphorus nitrogen and where do you have the replenishment of this you have replenishment of this from sahara so the rich amazon rainforest that you see today they are existing why they are basically existing because of sahara they are existing because of the dead carcasses of sahara this is a very eye opening guys what you see as the rich lush rainforest why those rainforests are existing? Why? Because you have minerals, you have 
minerals like calcium, phosphorus, which are being blown out of Sahara and deposited over there, which support the rich life forms of Amazon. So, no life on earth or no life form on earth goes underutilized. Even if that life form is dead, in some or the other way, it supports other life forms. So, this is how much beautifully earth is connected. For Amazon to exist, you need Sahara. Please keep this in mind. This is a very, very uh, eye opening kind of perspective. Even when I got this perspective, I couldn't sleep. That how beautifully life on earth is interlinked, that the dead is feeding the living. The dead on earth is practically feeding the living on earth. And those organisms who have died basically, these organisms are now supporting the most beautiful, the most ex extensive rainforest on earth. And this article is again, or this just small keynote, there I say article is regards to this only. So Anoop, Sonali, Amit, those who are watching me, I hope that this information is kind of an eye opening for you all. And this is how your life should be. Okay, even if you pass on, you have such legacy which people will follow. So even if you are living, you should live with such good legacy. You should die with such good legacy that other people will follow your legacy. And that is what is called as a big life. Okay, so let me just read this article. Very eye-opening article, very eye-opening keynote. You can use this everywhere in your answers. Atmospheric dust helps nourish oceanic systems. The atmospheric dust helps nourish oceanic systems. Okay, I'm reading nutrients derived from atmospheric dust deposited on the ocean surface. Nutrients derived from atmospheric dust. So if you have the dust being blown out from Sahara, if you have the dust being blown out from the Australian outback, the deserts of Australia, that dust is deposited where? That dust is deposited where? On the oceanic surface. And on this oceanic surface, who is consuming the dust? Where? It plays a key role in mediating global plankton biomass distribution. In mediating global plankton biomass distribution. Now, you will be asking me, sir, what is plankton and basically what is phytoplanktons? So, there are three groups of planktons. Planktons are basically those organisms which keep on floating in the waters, in the oceanic waters. So, phytoplankton is one of the group of planktons which survive on sunlight. So, you will find predominantly phytoplanktons in the photic zone of the oceans, in those zone of the oceans where sunlight can penetrate basically. Okay. So, if the sunlight is able to penetrate, you have a good population of phytoplanktons. And mind you guys, phytoplanktons is one of the most important food source for majority of the big oceanic creatures. Whales, seals, okay, all the other small fishes, they all depend on phytoplankton as their primary energy source. So make sure that you understand this concept that the atmospheric dust helps support what? The population of phytoplankton and, and it will support what? The rich biodiversity of the oceans. So now whenever you will see the sands of Sahara, whenever you will see the sands of any desert, please don't treat it as a desert topography. Please don't treat it as a barren landscape. It is because of them that you are having rich biodiversity of the oceans. It is because of them that you are having rich green forests on earth. Okay. So everything on earth is interconnected. That is how beautiful our planet is. And such keynotes bring a very big smile to me. Why? Because you have a greater connection with the planet. Okay. Using a 14 year global time series of modeled dust deposition. So this keynote has been brought by research of how many years? 14 year global time series of modeled dust deposition. Researchers investigated the impact of atmospheric nourishment on global plankton distribution. So this is a 14 year old or a 14 year kind of research initiative. And because of this, we are able to understand that how Atmospheric dust basically supports the rich marine life of the oceans. So you can have direct questions in mains. You can have prelims based questions too. So please remember this keynote from that perspective. Okay. So now let's move ahead to the discussion of the most important article of today. And I want each and every one of you to pay close attention to this. 
Okay. Hmm. This article it with regards to the India's first water-based body census. Okay. Now, this issue came roughly one week back in the main page, in the headlines page. This issue also came in the editorial page, but I deliberately did not discuss this issue with you all. Why? Because I knew that this issue is so damn important that it will somehow come in the test and context page. So this has ultimately come in the text and context page as an explainer. So this is full one page explainer where if you just do this one article, your understanding of the water bodies of India, your understanding of the utilization of water bodies in India will be taken care of and what needs to be done in the future will also be taken care of. So please focus on this article very very properly so that you have a working understanding as to what should be done, what is the present status and how you have variations in the different water bodies of India. So India's first national water body census. What is the importance of water body census? So why this census is so damn important up till now why we didn't do it? How has the census thrown light on rainfall patterns? So how can you interpret the rainfall patterns on the basis of water bodies? What are some of the shortcomings with respect to the data collected? So you all know none of the census, none of the research is complete. You have some loopholes, you have some shortcomings. So we'll do that. Does the data give insight into natural ecosystems and how water bodies sustain them? So is this data relevant for your understanding of the natural systems? of your understanding of the recharge of groundwater, your understanding of the recharge of the rivers per se and how you have the different water bodies being used differently at different places. Okay, so let us now start this article and the first question that we will try to answer is that why you need to have such kind of census? Why there is a need that you need to have census of water bodies in India? And guys, this article has the maximum propensity of being asked in the mains. So, everyone, those who are watching me, those who will watch me, please summarize this article. I am again saying again and again. Then don't say that once you have this question asked in mains from where it has come. Highest propensity. Okay. So, the story so far, the findings of the first ever water body census conducted by what? Conducted by Ministry of Jal Shakti was published recently why a water body census is necessary. Okay, so today India is facing numerous threats. India is facing numerous threats with regards to the environmental hazards. Okay, so the water bodies in India are increasingly facing which threats? The anthropogenic threats. So the first paragraph of this keynote or the first paragraph of this first sub question is dedicated to threat perception the significance of water bodies and why do we need a census okay india is facing a water crisis with groundwater decline you all know that groundwater is extracted at a very alarming scale in india biodiversity loss we have discussed numerous articles and climate change increasing the frequency of floods and droughts so i guess this is fairly um, self explanatory to everyone that what in what sense india is facing water crisis on the basis of groundwater decline, on the basis of biodiversity loss, because as you have the natural wetlands, as you have the natural sponges being lost to urbanization, so you don't have anything to absorb. And because of this biodiversity loss, you have heavy floods and climate change, which will also increase the frequency of floods and droughts. In this context, water bodies are important. Now, this paragraph is with regards to the significance of water bodies. What water bodies actually do? They buffer against climatic variability, holding flood waters for use in dry periods. So, if you have a small water body in your town and if you are suffering from very intense summer season or if the rainfall is subdued in the area, so that water body can act as a buffer for your water scarcity. They contribute to flood and water security as well as livelihoods by recharging the groundwater and providing water for irrigation and livestock. 
everything is self explanatory they also have cultural and ecological significance so if you see <laughs> the notes of india you have <laughs> one of the note you have rani ki wow okay so johards in rajasthan the khunds in the eastern india okay bamboo drip irrigation so all of these are traditional water management practices of india they do have ecological they do have cultural significance okay however water bodies are increasingly under the threat from pollution encroachment urbanization and drying so what are the four threats which water bodies in india are facing number first pollution number two encroachment number three urbanization and number fourth drying okay as water bodies are managed by different are managed by we need are managed by different agencies from state to local private entities so you don't have one central agency to basically monitor all of the water bodies the data must be uniform and easily accessible so this is the first thing that why we need census okay to actually manage water bodies we need conceptual and traditional knowledge of communities which are to be integrated with the formal data so if you want to really manage the water bodies you first need to understand how they were managed traditionally and how you will have the management with regards to the modern day applications too so you need to utilize science and technology and you also need to have the utilization from the traditional perspective so both of them is necessary okay while data on the reservoirs and rivers has been available on india water resources information system the last few years there has been no data on water bodies that are the lifeline of rural india and critical flood control and recreational spaces in these cities so you do have that data which is available on the riverfront side which is available from the basin side but what about the small lakes what about the small ponds what about the small percolated tanks seepage tanks or the check dams which are made locally as rainwater harvesting system so you absolutely have no data on that and let's take out the rivers from our perspective let's take out the big big catchment areas of river so let us take out indus take out let us take out ganges let us take out yamuna let us take out brahmaputra from our perspective now do you think that all of the remaining water bodies are of no significance to india absolutely not local communities are heavily reliant on the local water bodies for their survival for their buffer to the extreme climatic variability hence the water based census is very very important why because we already have data on the reservoirs and the rivers available through what the what indian water resources information system wiis from the last few years there has been no data on small water bodies that are the lifeline of rural india and critical cultural flood control and recreational spaces in the cities so you that is why you need census why because you need to have localized data and again guys i am reiterating here you can use web3 okay the decentralized data analytics tool of web3 where you can aggregate all of this data and you can use it as a central repository data scheme too okay so another application of web3 okay how was the census conducted okay and what was the objective okay the census objective was to develop a national database with information on size purpose ownership status and conditions of water bodies it covered all natural and human made units bounded on all sides for storing water irrespective of condition or use so objective was what the objective was to develop a national database with information on size purpose ownership status and conditions of water bodies it covered all natural and human made units so if you have natural lakes if you have natural ponds they were covered irrespective of what irrespective of the conditions of whether they are in use or out of use so let's say you are having a small village and just besides that village you are having a small pond or lake now whether that lake is in use whether that pond is in use it does not matter we are covering that 
okay so whether a water body is in use or it is out of use it will not matter we'll try to cover everything okay a software for data entry and a mobile app for capturing the location and visual of water bodies were developed and data processing workshops were conducted to train the surveys in all states and union territories so that is how the data of the water bodies was captured a software for data entry and mobile app for capturing the location and visual of water bodies were developed and it was done across all the territories and union territories and the states of india okay what has the data shown okay the observations are very very important okay what are the observations what are the conclusions of the survey what are the conclusions of the census that is very important so you have three observations you have three kind of outcomings of the survey of the data so you need to remember these three outcomings the first most water bodies in the country are very small okay the vast majority of india's water bodies are less than one hectare large okay so it's somewhat astonishing guys but yes that is what is evident in india that if i ask you what is the average size of water bodies in india your answer should be less than one hectare okay so this is one of the most first and the most astonishing kind of outcomings of the survey this means locating and keeping a track of them is likely to remain a challenge why because majority of the water bodies in india or most dare i say are less than one hectare the second is the water bodies show regional patterns that correlate with rainfall so you have what you have regional patterns in the water bodies correlating with the monsoonal rainfall in general drier states like gujarat maharashtra and rajasthan water bodies tend to be larger and publicly held so if you are having a state where you have intense water stress where the rainfall is less so you need to have more buffer with regards to the climate with regards to the weather of that particular place and hence there the water bodies tends to be big and they tend to be controlled by whom by the public because ultimately people are going to need water for their survival whereas in water parts of the country in the wetter parts of the country like kerala west bengal and states in the northeast more than three quarters of water bodies are privately owned so in the drier states majority of the water bodies are publicly owned whereas in the wetter states three quarters more than three quarters of water bodies are privately owned okay in drier states the water bodies are primarily used for irrigation and ground water recharge as a agricultural buffer while in the wetter states domestic use and pisciculture dominate domestic use and pisciculture so you have the local aquaculture where you have the breeding of fish and marine organisms for economy purposes so in the drier states the water bodies are used for what they are used for irrigation they are used for groundwater research predominantly whereas in the wetter states the water bodies are used for what primarily they are used for domestic use it might be recreational too and they are also used for what pisciculture so you are breeding fish okay mid sized water bodies are largely panchayat owned mid sized water bodies in india are largely owned by whom by panchayat okay so if i am quickly summarizing this point for you all so the big water bodies in india are publicly owned which states you will find big water bodies predominantly the drier states gujarat maharashtra rajasthan the wetter states will have which kind of water bodies predominantly the privately owned water bodies and what will be the utilization of those bodies it will be for domestic use and for pisciculture the mid sized water bodies of india will be largely panchayat owned okay most water bodies have never been repaired or rejuvenated the third kind of observation most of the water bodies have never been repaired once they are made they are left to the whim of nature okay or rejuvenated okay means they are never been redeveloped okay several water bodies are classified not in use meaning despite the recent interest in rejuvenating water bodies most of them have never been repaired or revived so this is very very important guys that 
the water bodies in india most of them are not in use most of them have never been repaired they have never been rejuvenated so you need to remember this three observations from india's perspective okay i am again reiterating these observations so they are very small less than 1 hectare average number 2 the water bodies they tend to have spatial variation big water bodies drier states small water bodies wetter states big water bodies publicly hold small bodies privately owned mid sized water bodies panchayat owned and most of the water bodies have never been revived they have never been rejuvenated and they never have been repaired and most of them are classified not in use okay <clears throat> Now, what do you mean by this? So, what are the suggestions? What is the future way forward if we want to utilize this data very, very properly? So, there are three to four suggestions. There are three to four ways ahead which you can utilize in the future so that we have even greater understanding of the water bodies in India. So, I will be discussing those three, four suggestions. So, the first water bodies have an important role in supporting biodiversity okay they harbor what they harbor fish that birds feed on and provide roosting and breeding spaces for residents and migratory birds these ecological functions are related to size and location of the water bodies but the latest water body census does not address any questions about this the report itself noted its preamble that water bodies support healthy ecosystem yet the focus was on exclusively human use, which means only pisciculture or fish farming, which seeded and does not reflect in the natural biodiversity. What do you mean by this? What do you mean by this observation? Or what do you mean by this suggestion? Now, in this census, we are primarily targeting what? We are primarily targeting the water body from human centric perspective whether that water body is important for our purpose whether that water body is solving our daily needs but is the water body existing for the use of humans only are we the only dominant species which use the water bodies no every water body will have its own ecological function it will have its own rich biodiversity so we are only talking about human centric functions but what about the ecological function so what is the future way using this census we also need to paint an ecological function of the water bodies wherein we will discuss what will discuss the ecological value will discuss the ecological significance of that water body and hence we can ensure proper management if a water body is very much ecologically sensitive is very much ecologically significant so it needs to be managed even more the management needs to be even more holistic are we doing that no so this is the future scope second thing okay the census is not also including the four major point of solution major point of pollution in the water bodies the census questionnaire may have left out the most common reasons of pollution like eutrophication, sewage pollution and solid waste dumping. So this census is not including the three major point source of pollutions. There I say four. Why? Because eutrophication, sewage treatment and solid waste dumping. It will also result into the bursting of algae it will also result into increased biological oxygen demand and because of this you will have certain invasive species also coming into the water bodies so the threat of invasive species will also increase so this census is also lacking data on this so you need to have a working understanding as to in future if we are conducting census it should also include data with regards to the pollutions like eutrophication the sewage pollution the solid waste dumping and whether whatever sewage is being dumped it is first treated or not so whether do you have septic treatment before the sewage is being dumped into the water bodies that we also need to assess okay secondly there are inconsistency in the census the census groups water bodies into five types so you have five types of water bodies in the census you have ponds you have tanks you have lakes you have reservoirs and you have water conservation schemes so these are the five types into which the census is grouping the water bodies ponds 
tanks, lakes, reservoirs and water conservation schemes. But now what is happening? However, these categories are not mutually exclusive. What do you mean by this? Many tanks that are traditionally used directly for irrigation serve primarily as recharge structures today. Based on the data, it appears that in Karnataka, these were classified as ponds and tanks serving the purpose of irrigation, whereas in Maharashtra, these were classified as water conservation structures, primarily serving the purpose of groundwater recharge. You need to understand this very, very properly. We are grouping the water bodies into five things. We are grouping the water bodies into ponds, tanks, lakes, reservoirs and conservation schemes. But when we are classifying this, we need to do a classification which is mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive means what? A tank shouldn't be used like a reservoir or a pond shouldn't be used like a water conservation scheme. I am saying this with regards to what? So let us consider the case of Karnataka and Maharashtra. In Karnataka, the tanks are predominantly used for what? They are predominantly used for irrigation. They are predominantly used for local water needs. Whereas in Maharashtra, the tanks are predominantly used for what? The tanks are predominantly used for groundwater research. So, tank is classified as an irrigation source somewhere, whereas tank is classified as a water conservation source somewhere. So, this classification is not concrete. In this classification, all the five categories are not mutually exclusive, they are somewhat mutually inclusive. So you need to have a classification which categorizes the water bodies as per their practical use, not as per their size only, okay, or not as per their appearance only. So you need to have working understanding that how a water body is utilized differently in different places. Where like again, I'm reiterating in Karnataka, the water tanks are basically used for what? They're basically used for irrigation. Whereas in Maharashtra, the water tanks are used for conservation purpose, for recharging the groundwater. So can you group tanks into two parts? Yes, you have to do that. Why? On the basis of what? On the basis of utilization. So tanks cannot be grouped separately or mutually into one thing only. You need to have two subgroups of tanks. This is very, very important. Okay. So the classification is not concrete. The classification needs to be exclusive. The classification needs to include more subcategories so that we have even more working understanding of the census. Next, the data was standardized across states. Some states like Gujarat do not show any water bodies not being in use. So in Gujarat, every water body is used. Whereas in Karnataka reports almost 80% of the water bodies as in the state of disuse. So guys, this is not done. In one state, you are saying that the water bodies are in use. In another state, you are saying 80% of the water bodies are not in use. So the data is not standardized. You need to standardize the data. This suggests differences in the interpretation by the enumerators. So this is very, very important. Okay. Now, you need to have a proper way forward. Okay, way forward in the sense that where India should move upon with regards to its census. So this article paints a very encouraging way forward wherein we try to paint a picture as to how we can move ahead with the handling of water bodies. Okay, so the first edition itself provides high level indications on the way forward by detailing ownership, state of use, costs of construction and repair. It points to how and why water bodies must be restored. You have the answer as to why we must restore what are their uh, significance which agencies capacities need to be strengthened and where and how much funds are needed and who will benefit from such efforts. So all of this is indicated by the survey. If such census are conducted every 5 or 10 years over time, they will accurately represent emerging trends and the state of water country as a whole. So if we have such kind of census, if we improve upon the shortcomings of the census, wherein we include more classification groups, wherein we try to include not only the anthropogenic functions, but the ecological functions, we have more standardization of data. So such census can solve a bigger purpose in understanding of countries' water resources. So guys, this was the most important article as of today. 
those who are watching me i hope this article is clear to you all and this has the maximum propensity to translate into mains this year so please make sure that you are summarizing this article very very properly i have sonali i have amit i have anup so i hope this article is imbibed in your brain and you are working upon it okay now let's move ahead to the discussion of another article <clears throat> okay so this article it's with regards to isro again this is a headline article guys isro to start online training programs for college students okay the name of the program itself is start okay so this is again awareness in the fields of science and it where we need to inculcate scientific temper in the young minds of india so now the government of india is shifting its focus now we are giving industry level knowledge directly to the aspirants pursuing postgraduate and doctorate courses so that they directly have applicability so that they directly have employability in a higher level okay the indian space research organization isro has announced a new introductory level online training program called space science and technology awareness training space science and technology awareness training start start is aimed at postgraduate and final year undergraduate students of physical sciences and technology so who will be benefiting from this the postgraduate and the final year undergraduate students okay what will be the coverage of the program the program will cover various domains of space science including astronomy and astrophysics heliophysics sun earth interaction instrumentation and aeronomy so these will be some of the areas where the program called as start will dominate it will cover various domains of space science including astronomy and astrophysics heliophysics sun earth interaction instrumentation and aeronomy it will be delivered by scientists from indian academy and isro centers so guys the second dimension which i opened up with you all today vocabulary words so this is where you need to understand you need to include such words in your answers so now which will be the area of focus astrophysics astronomy heliophysics sun earth interaction instrumentation and aeronomy so these words you need to imbibe in your brain why because majority of the questions that will come in the mains that will come in the prelims they will include such terminologies so you need to write these terminologies in a separate diary especially those people who don't have science as their graduation and don't have the science background why because these words they tend to come in prelims they tend to come in mains so you need to have a working understanding of this hence i introduced you to the second dimension that you need to summarize these words too okay the last article of today okay <clears throat> again an article on the basis of judicial overreach okay but you can use this article with regards to judicial adventurism too okay wherein the judiciary is telling the executive the judiciary is basically giving orders to executive do something and this is very important guys because today you all know that coming red tapism is at its peak with regards to the functioning of the government officiaries the constitutional bodies so hence the supreme court of india has basically directed all the wings of the government all the investigation agencies of the government to install cctv cameras okay install cctv cameras in offices of investigative agencies by july 18 says supreme court okay supreme court has given the center 3 months setting a july 18 deadline to comply with the directions in its december 2020 judgment to install cctv cameras in the offices of its investigative agencies such as cbi the nia and the ed for the sake of transparency and protection of human rights of accused and under trial prisoners okay you all know that sometimes these agencies are used for malicious purposes you have case studies of that sometimes you have ill treatment of the prisoners ill treatment of the under trial so hence supreme court has said that please sir madam install cctv camera okay supreme court observed that it is disheartening that several agencies had not taken any steps to comply with the court orders it is disheartening to note that in so far as union of india is concerned 
out of the seven investigative agencies no steps of sincere nature have been taken in case of four investigative agencies so out of seven only four only three have installed four have not yet taken and which territory in india accounts where you have 100 percent installation of ccdv that is important okay the court noted that only two uts of india andaman and nicobar islands and ladakh as well as the state of mizoram and goa have fully complied with the directions making the budgetary allocations as well as actually installing the ccdv camera so only mizoram and goa and only the uts of andaman nicobar and ladakh have the installment of cctv cameras in all of their investigative agencies offices so guys this is again a very important headline dictat so you can basically use this as a judicial dictat let me just write down on the board this is judicial overreach or judicial dictat okay wherein the supreme court is giving orders please do this okay please do this otherwise you will end up in trouble okay so guys these were some of the important articles of the 7th may and 8th may i hope that you are all comfortable with the article and i hope that each one of you will follow the water body census article very very closely why because that article has the maximum propensity to come in mains so please understand the significance of water bodies please understand the threats please understand the observations of the surveys please understand where the survey is lagging and what is the future scope in India. So these five things you need to remember. I am again reiterating my name for you all. My name is Pritesh Mathurkar. You can reach out to me by doing a global search on Telegram at the Hindu Analysis Zone. The channel name is Hindu Analysis Zone itself. Okay. So on the behalf of Study IQ IS English, I thank each and every one of you who have watched me online live and those who will watch me in the future sessions. I hope that these sessions will enlighten you. These sessions will propel you to work even further. So work hard and smart guys. All the best to you all. See you on the other side tomorrow sharp at 9am. Take care everyone. Bye-bye.